hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I like conferences of this size, so um, it's it's much much nicer in my opinion to get to know the people and uh, when it's 100 people and not uh, 8,000. Um, so today we'll be talking about build, share, and run um, of Wasm using uh, Docker. Um, uh, so I'll start by introducing myself and then uh, hand over to Michael. I'm Chris Croner. I'm a director of engineering at Docker in the content group. Uh, we're responsible for some of the low-level pieces like runtime, build, and registry, as well as um, content you'll know of, of things like Docker official images, uh, Docker verified publishers, and some of the newer things we've been doing at Docker, which include uh, desktop extensions and um, Atomist. Um, Michael? Okay. Um, thank you, Chris. Yes, my name is Michael Yuan, and I'm a uh, <laughs> uh, uh, founder of a company called Second State, but um, you know more relevantly, uh, I'm a uh, um, uh, the maintainer of the Wasm Edge project at uh, CNCF. Um, you know, um, I'm going to tell you in a, in a couple minutes after, you know, um, you know, why there need another Wasm runtime outside of Wasm time and what are the unique features that we have and why we work with Docker. So please. Yeah. All right, so uh, when I was thinking about talking uh, today, I, it really got me thinking about why do we want isolation? Um, and uh, it, it's quite a it's quite a pre prevalent thing inside uh, software where we have isolation and separation in lots of different places. Um, the, the first case is facilitating reuse, and we heard a lot of this uh, earlier about the component model. When you, um, when you build well-defined interfaces, you can um, create these boxes of value and reuse them. And that's not just for yourself um, inside your own company or just you know, on your own projects, but you can then share them with other people. And that's a really valuable thing. It, it has this compounding effect of not rebuilding everything. Um, the second one is about sharing compute resources. So by isolating uh, your workload, you can share compute resources in different ways. Uh, this starts with, uh, you know, my dad was an engineer as well, and he, he would uh, use punched cards. And the scheduling mechanism was literally a piece of paper. You write your name on the list, and you get a slot of time, and you get to go and run your punched cards. Um, that theme in computing of we want to use the maximum we can of a shared resource, which is compute, um, has continued, except the, the boundaries have changed a little bit, right? So um, we wanted to find good boundaries because we, we might not necessarily trust the people we're running uh, code next to. Um, we might not trust our own code not to pull down somebody else's workload as well. Like that's another case um, where we want to have these well-defined boundaries. So you want to be able to say, what, what are the capabilities of what I'm running? Can it hurt other workloads? Can other workloads hurt me? Um, how, do we, how do we make sure that, um, that the code doesn't interfere with other code running? And, and then ease of delivery of applications. I think this is another thing that's really made software unique in, in its velocity is the speed with which we can deliver value to customers. If you compare a manufacturing plant or things like that, it takes you know, months or years to get things to people, whereas in software, it's literally seconds. And that is an incredibly powerful, again, compounding effect that's enabled by isolation. And we do that by having well-defined packaging mechanisms if you know, if you have a well-defined box like a shipping container or, or a, a, a container, a software container, um, you can build infrastructure that allows you to, to deliver much, much more quickly. And that's a really, really powerful thing that isolation and separation enables. So taking a look at some of the isolation techniques that we have in, in, in our domain, um, we have kind of a, a spectrum and there's lots of different uh, ways of doing this. So one example on the extreme side is air-gapped. This is where you literally don't trust anybody um, outside of your compute space, and um, you make the compromise on that ease of delivery by literally having to physically be next to the machine um, to deploy it. Um, but that, that comes with a bunch of security guarantees. Uh, hardware virtualization, um, this is kind of the thing that kicked off cloud computing, right? You no longer needed to plug a computer in or have access to a data center you could use an API. I mean, this is crazy uh, if you think about it. You could, you could literally call an API and create a, uh, an instance of, of compute. Uh, then, you know, we're at Wasm Day, I have to bring up stack virtualization. When you control the runtime and the language, you can start looking at what kind of guarantees, what kind of, how can we cut this up? What, what boundaries can we create? What interfaces can we create um, to, uh, to give us these, these, uh, these, uh, this isolation in, in various different forms um, to, to improve uh, the software delivery? Um, containers, of course, I work at Docker. I have to bring up containers at some point. Um, containers are interesting because they leverage the same kernel, but they isolate the processes from each other. So um, they can't see file system unless you let them, you, they can't see each other unless you let them. 
This also gives you some of those guarantees of um, my workload won't bring down somebody else's workload. You can set up limits in terms of memory and things like that to ensure that. Um, and then raw processes, we kind of defer to the OS to say, you handle the boundaries between things. Um, by default, a lot of the time, that is, uh, it's open bar on the file system within that user's uh, space. Uh, Mac OS, for example, has started locking this down a bit. If you touch sensitive things, they'll prompt the user for, for permission. But that's, you know, this is another box where you can ship a raw process and you have access to lots of things. Um, and then kind of finally on the extreme end, you have dynamic libraries which have you know, well-defined um, interfaces. You can get a header file, for example, which tells you exactly um, what inputs you put in, what outputs you get out, uh, and you can share memory inside the process so you can get really high performance. Um, so that obviously brings up the question, well, which, which isolation mechanism, which of these tools should I use? And I get to pull out the Simpsons meme here. Um, <laughs> it, really, it really just depends, um, and it, it's kind of hard. When I started this talk, I thought I could throw up something like this, and I have to quickly push the down arrow before you try to take a photo of that. I thought I could put up three, <laughs> three dimensions and say, you know, if you care about isolation, uh, use this. If you care about ease of use, th these are the ones that are better. Or if you care about resource utilization, use that. But I realized quite quickly it's much, much more nuanced than that. And that's why we have the CNCF landscape. This is <laughs> but it's, I, I showed this in every talk when I talk uh, for the CNCF. Um, it's, everybody laughs because it's so painful. Um, and part of it is because developers love building tools. But the other part of it is there is no one perfect tool in any domain. And I feel like it's our, especially at Docker's, uh, job to try and help people navigate this landscape. Um, if you show this to a developer who's just trying to ship a feature, what are, what are they supposed to do with this? This is crazy. Like, we need to help them navigate this space uh, with the right tools to solve the problems that they have. Um, so the, the theme of this should be pick the right tool for the job that you're doing. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to Michael, who can, who can talk a little bit more about Wasm. All right. Thank you, Chris. So when to use Wasm? And uh, we all quickly go through those, uh, those points. Of course, running something in the browser, that's the original use case, right? Um, if you're building an application from source and can output Wasm, that sort of is a um, you know, prerequisite, right? You, know, you, have, you have to have a language that can output Wasm. You know, if you don't, like in Python or JavaScript, you have to have a runtime that's embedded in Wasm. And uh, what I find most interesting is something that needs a quick startup time. So you know, um, that's the serverless use case, you know, where you know, if you look at uh, AWS Lambda, you know, one of the biggest complaints is that uh, the, the codes are too slow. So how do you deal with that? You can have warmed up instance, right? You know. However, with Wasm, like uh, we have seen in Fermion Spin, you, know, uh, you can just uh, spin up as requests come in, you know, so you do, don't need warm, warm up. And even if in cases where we're going to talk about in a minute, where you do have long-lived servers, you know, like a CRM, you know, something like that, Wasm takes a lot less space than, say, you know, uh, a container plus Linux kernel and, and all that, right? You know, so for short lived, uh, you know, so for something that needs startup time, uh, whether it's start on demand or it's a warmed up instance, Wasm uh, both offers significant advantages. And uh, then there's, uh, we have seen from early talks about component model, you know, there's a lot of security considerations that's especially relevant today with, with all the, um, you know, supply chain software, supply chain security issues and uh, requires small incremental overhead, you know, that Wasm can run in a much smaller package than, anything, uh, than, than most of its competitors. And when not to use Wasm, of course, you know, um, application require multi-threading. However, there's, uh, um, you know, um, as we have also seen, there's, uh, um, you know, threading proposals in, Was um, in, in, in WebAssembly already, and uh, at Wasm Edge, we're already, uh, we already implementing that. You know, that's, uh, um, you know, but um, currently this is one of the limitations. But I also want to point out that uh, if you look at common server-side languages like uh, JavaScript, it's also single-threaded. It's just a um, multitask on a single thread, right? You know, and the second is the uh, garbage collect languages. At this moment, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised to see Fermion's presentation that, uh, you know, <laughs> Java actually runs. And there's a way to get around the GC, you know, because the short-lived application, you don't need GC. And I thought that was, uh, you know, very interesting. And then the... The third time, the third thing is that, um, you know, that's what, uh, to borrow an old industry term, is that it's, uh, it's an opinionated setup. You know, it's a WASM, is that it needs something that so you have to develop based on, um, you know, um, um, its ideas. Um, you know, so uh, very much unlike, you know, um, and Docker, you know, that's, um, you know, that, that has been popular for a very long time. You know, you can't just take a Linux application and run a WASM, so you have to, uh, you know, use a, a different set of tools that also give rise to uh, the need for developer tools. So 
you know, I want to uh, give you a quick demo, you know, that's um, to show you some of the things that we have done in the, in the developer tooling area. So um, the application I want to show you is a microservice. You know, um, so if you look at, um, so it's written in Rust. If you look at this code, you know, it's a, it's a Tokyo application. It's a, normally it would not compile to Wasm or, you know, it would not run on Wasm, but uh, I'll tell you in a minute how we did it. So make it run on Wasm. You know, so it's a Tokyo application that start up a web server that listens at port 8080. So it's, uh, it's using the standard Tokyo MIO and hyper library in Rust. And what it does is that when a uh, request comes in, it asynchronously start a, a handler method called classify. You know, what it does is that does AI inference. It's, um, it's called a, a TensorFlow model to look at the input image and then generate the output, right? You know, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's what I just said. It's a single threaded but multitasking. You know, it's utilized the non-blocking IO that's available in the in in system. So it's, uh, uh, so, you know, it's uh, while the data comes in, it doesn't have to wait. It can, it, it can handle the next request. And the classify method is not difficult either. If you are familiar with machine learning or AI inference on Python, you will find it's you know it's um, um, it's very easy to follow uh, even in the Rust language. So what it does is that it has a request body. So you know because it's a handler method, so it gives you the HTTP body, and then um, you know you are supposed to return the HTTP response, right? Um, and uh, um, so in, in the method, it's first to load the TensorFlow mo uh, model, which is a mobile net is image classification model. And then it gets the image from the, uh, fr um, here, it's uh, post classify. It gets the image itself from the HTTP body and then transform that into a tensor and then run the tensor model through the, uh, through, uh, through the TensorFlow runtime, which gets back another tensor. That tensor is a list of probabilities of different image labels of their probability in a, in a file. Then you look up your English names for that label and then print it out. You know, so that's all there to it. You know, that's a, that's an entire microservice that does um, you know um, um, uh, AI inference on a, um, could, uh, you could do that on a very small device. So let's uh, let's see it in action. So I'm going to do a live demo here. You know, so <laughs> you know, so uh, to see if it works. Although I, I did cheat a lot. You know, um, cheat a little so that um, you know I cache. The, the cargo build from last time. So if I do the cargo build, you know, I can build this, um, yeah, so it's done, you know, so um, because there's, um, because it's, uh, everything's up to date, right? So I can build this um, uh, Rust application into Wasm. And then I use the, the Wasm Edge runtime. You know, Wasm Edge runtime supports the whole uh, WASI NN standards, you know, so it does uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, OpenVINO, and all that. So if I, if I run this, what it does is that it listens on the port 8080. You know, that's, uh, um, it starts the server inside Wasm. It's not, uh, it's not a host function that's, uh, that embeds Wasm, but inside Wasm it starts a server. And then on this side, on another terminal, I can query the server, I can send it a picture. Send it a picture and it would uh, return immediately because this is done on native, you know, um, um, on TensorFlow. So what it says is uh, the pictures, um, there's a high confidence that the picture contains a, a military uniform. So what is that picture? You know, so um, that's a picture is someone uh, is something that everybody has seen in the past. You know, it's uh, um, it's Dr. Grace Hopper, right? You know, she's uh, um, um, you know um, in her uh, U.S. Navy uniform. So that's um, the entire demo for for Wasm Edge. And uh, so let me. So just to summarize, you know, um, what is Wasm Edge? Wasm Edge is a Wasm runtime uh, in CNCF. It's, uh, it's, com it's compliant with all the, um, I say, published Wasm standards, and it's also uh, strive to implement a lot of those, um, you know, um, um, standards in the pipeline. And we uh, very much would, uh, would be love to be part of the uh, component, um, you know, model process, you know, to be, um, to be one of the implementers in, in that space. And uh, um, so uh, while we conform to all the uh, Wasm standard, and I think one of the interesting things that we, we do is that we are uh, LVM-based AOT, you know, so that's, um, that's, that gives us, you know, uh, there's lots of benchmarks so that give us a near native performance with, uh, um, you know, um, um, you know um, between uh, the Wasm bytecode and, uh, and, and, the, and, and native application compiled from Rust. And we support a wide variety of OS, in, including non-POSEC OSs like, uh, like Cell 4, you know, that's um, it's a real-time operating system widely used in drones and in autonomous, autonomous vehicles. And it supports um, popular CPU architectures like, um, you know, like RISC-V, right? You know, so, and then we are, um, um, you know, our use case, we are especially optimized for the cloud and edge. So, um, 
like you have seen, you know, we have done, um, you know, um, 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 a networking support through our VM so that uh, inside the VM you can run uh, asynchronous applications um, um, that has, um, you know, uh, network capabilities so like Tokyo, right? That's, that's open store for um, connecting microservices, uh, databases, um, you know, um, uh, and other web services. And we also have a driver for uh, Kafka queues and, you know, things like that. It works well with service frameworks like Dapper SDK, which I'm going to talk about tomorrow in DapperCon. And uh, uh, it has native support for AI inference. So if the, if the underlying TensorFlow or PyTorch model runs on GPU or TPU, the, uh, the bottom runtime would be able to take advantage of that as well. And it has first-class support for JavaScript. You know, so we are uh, striving to be uh, full Node.js compatibility within this quarter. You know, so we have, uh, you know, we have several developers that implement the entire Node.js APIs um, you know, um, on our um, 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 JavaScript interpreter. So I think that's, yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll pick it up from yeah, here. Yeah, okay. um, thank you, Michael. So um, looking at the developer tooling for WASM, it was brought up in one of the talks earlier today. It's not that easy to get things set up. Um, Rust and Golang have made things a lot easier to do things like cross compiles. I, I come from a C++ era where the, it was much darker and much more difficult um, than, than with those tools. But you still have a lot of those same problems of, uh, I'm running Rust version this, you're running Rust version of that, the CI is running um, some other Rust version, and, uh, and then there's all the uh, other tooling. You may have um, a different runtime like WASM Edge set up. Uh, you may have uh, testing tools or other, other things that you're using. And what that lands up meaning is you, you run into that same problem of, well, it works on my machine. I don't know why it's not working on yours or on CI, which as a developer really hurts me. I hate that. Um, uh, it, it also requires learning a lot of uh, new tools and new flows. And, I think, especially people like you who are on the leading edge of technologies, you're kind of used to playing in the tooling space and this is okay for you. But for developers who are, you know, nine to five developers working in companies, this is really, really painful. Um, each new tool that they get given is just extra overhead on, on top of their normal jobs and having to learn them uh, is, is really hard for them. It, it slows them down and it frustrates them. So we talk about the magic of Docker um, and I think there are two core magics. The first one is uh, what works on my machine, works on yours, and then in production. Uh, if you use, uh, the way that I use Docker now, I, I have many fewer instances where I have to do whip commits against the CI, because if, if I have a Dockerized flow that I run locally, and then on the CI, I'm sure it's gonna run the same. That magic is, is really, really um, profound. Um, the second one is I can build things and then share them, and you can build on top of them, or I can consume things that you've built. And, this is that compounding effect that that isolation gives us, the ability to build on top of what others have done that makes our industry um, move so quickly and, and deliver so much value. The foundation of that in, our, uh, in the container ecosystem is, is images, so this ability to store things in OCI artifacts and then um, either consume them directly uh, as, a, as a network service or uh, to build on top of them. Um, and the other magic of Docker is now that we've got millions of developers using it, there's a simple flow that developers already know. They already know how to do um, these commands. And I would posit, because you're tooling people mostly, uh, you probably have all used these commands too, and you probably are quite familiar with them. So this didn't happen by accident, right? Um, th the core thing behind the success of what runs on my machine, runs on yours, runs on CI, runs in production, is standardization. The reason you can run a container on your desktop with Docker Desktop then in GitHub CI uh, or GitHub Action CI, and then on and deploy to ECS, AWS ECS, is because of these runtime, the runtime specification, the image specification, and the distribution specification. These are the core things that, that provide that magic. Um, this doesn't happen by accident either. You can't just standardize a thing. You have to work in the open, and I'm really encouraged to see what's happening with the Bytecode Alliance and, and, and other efforts inside the Western community. Um, that really allows you to uh, develop these open standards and collaborate not just within your company or your team, but across companies and industries. This really is the, you know, the, the rising tide lifts all boats. And the reason the container ecosystem is so big is because of these open standards and because we can work across and not, you know, not have one, one thing in, in, in any of these domains. On our side, we, or we're using the OCI to do this mechanism, which is kind of analogous, I guess, to some of the Bytecode Alliance pieces. Um, so with that, I'm gonna swap laptops because uh, I'm doing a live demo. <laughs> and we want to really tempt the, uh, <laughs> yay for live demos. Yeah. <laughs> I always appreciate them, so I feel like it's, uh, it, it, I, have to, I have to do it. All right, are we going to get a, oh, did that work? Not yet. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. 
It is working? Yay, already. Yay for live demos. <laughs> so what I'm going to demo is I'm going to demo a, a, a technical preview of Docker Desktop. I'll share links. Don't worry, you'll be able to get it, which has WASI um, uh, support built in. We're using WASM Edge uh, through a container D shim at the moment, but that's, that should be pluggable as well. I'll start with the Docker Compose file here. Um, I hope most of you are familiar with Docker Compose, but I have, I have the, the canonical trip, uh, three service application. I have a client, a front end JavaScript client, a server, which is a, um, a Rust server uh, compiled to WASI WASM32. Uh, and then I have a DB, uh, just a MariaDB, because I couldn't get MySQL working on my M1 Mac. I'm not sure why. Um, so what this will do then is uh, the, the server, the, West, the Rust server will uh, write things to a DB and be able to query them. And the uh, GUI will be able to read them out. And notice that two of the services are in containers, and the one is a, um, is a WASM module. Uh, to build this. I have a, a Docker file, um, and what this does is it cross compile from my local architecture straight to uh, WASI, um, uh, WASI WASM32. Uh, you'll also see here that I'm running um, WASM Edge's AOT um, optimizations, so we get uh, much higher performance here. And with Tokyo and, um, and coroutines, essentially, we can, we can handle many more requests in parallel. And then, uh, speaking to Ralph earlier, this is you can close your eyes, but we're using a from scratch image <laughs> and we're copying the, the WASM result into that so we can reuse some of the OCI um, pieces. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is, like a good cooking show, I've pre-baked pre this, um, but I'll, I'll do a compose build. Uh, and you'll see uh, if it can resolve everything. Uh, hopefully everything's cached, there we go. And if I inspect this image, um, you'll see that it's, a, it's got the architecture WASI, WASM32 and an OS WASI. This is just, if I do a Docker images, um, you'll actually see it um, pop up so that you can see it's the WASM day one or the server one. I've just retagged it. Um, and then, of course, if I do a Docker compose up, um, this would implicitly build it, but otherwise it just launches everything for you. So this is a flow that specifically front-end developers are very familiar with, with Docker, where you just do a Docker compose up, it builds everything it needs to build, it downloads all the images it needs, and you've got something up and running. Um, I'm going to start up a second terminal here. Hopefully, it's, uh, it's not too, too big. And I'm just going to initialize this. Um, and then I'm going to upload uh, a couple of orders. So you can tell I'm a back-end engineer because uh, um, this, is my, this is my home. And uh, if I go over to here, I can reload. And this is uh, querying that front-end service now. So what's happening is I've queried the front-end service. Um, that's uh, hitting the, the, the WASM, uh, Rust WASM server, which is querying the database and pulling things up. And I can do operations here that kind of uh, travel through as well. So that's uh, containers and WASM sitting side by side, kind of transparently, actually, which is, um, it, it seems like an anticlimactic demo, but, <laughs> but there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so, so here it is inside desktop as well. We, we also made it so you can see that this is a WASM32 um, uh, thing that's running. Uh, and notice that the networking is working as well, just as it does with Compose. Um, uh, and of course, uh, I pushed this earlier to, to Docker Hub, so you can see up here we have it up on, on, on a demo repo. All right, I'm going to pull it back to the, uh, the slides. So, uh, so what we've done here then is uh, we, we've got the same workflow that a lot of developers who use containers today already know. This Docker compose up, um, and then you're just going. Some of them will do Docker build, some of them will do Docker push as well, but they've, they've got the same flow that they've used for containers before, but this time they're using WASM. Um, we output an OCI image, and because we output an OCI image, we can reuse OCI compliant registries. And this is great because um, having worked with teams who run registries, it's less fun than it sounds. <laughs> and it's, um, you know, reusing what we have is, uh, is, 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 is really valuable. Um, the other thing is because of the WASI uh, runtime standard, we can then take that and run it, uh, uh, take that image and run it on a WASI um, runtime. In this case, we used WASI image, but there's no reason you couldn't use any WASI um, compatible uh, runtime. Uh, all of this is built into Docker Desktop, and we have millions of developers who use Docker Desktop, so uh, this means that they would just have this, uh, have this right there for them to use. Uh, and the interoperability with containers, I think, is an important piece, too, because like VMs haven't been displaced by containers, containers are not going to be displaced by uh, WASM, and we need an interop story. You need to use the right tool for the job, and um, in a lot of cases, for example, you'll have existing web services or a DB, and so what you want to be able to do is interface with them. So what's next? Well, uh, we're just getting started. Uh, Docker is new to the WASM space, uh, and, and we realize that. Uh, we want to work with the WASM community. Uh, we, we really do want to do this in a collaborative fashion. 
And we want to share our experience from the container ecosystem. We've learned a lot over the last several years, and we want to bring this to, to help um, bring WASM to more people. And I think some of you may have already seen the blog post, but we're actually joining the Bytecode Alliance as well, so we can help do that formally. Um, of course, it also wouldn't be a Wasson speech if I didn't show you Solomon's tweet, which is uh, notorious in your circles. So, so um, you know, I, I think people, as Justin pointed out in the keynote, people kind of misinterpreted this. Um, and I feel like we really are coming full circle with what I demoed today, where um, in that second tweet where he says, uh, imagine a future uh, where Docker runs Linux containers, Windows containers, and Wasson containers side by side. Um, well, that's exactly what we've demoed today. So um, I know you're all, most, well, most of you are probably engineers. You want to get the code. I've got a, a, a QR code you can scan there. Otherwise, you can look at my GitHub repo. I've got links to the, the versions of Docker Desktop and, um, some, and some demo repos that were provided by uh, Michael's team as well. So you can, you can just Docker compose up and, and play around. All right. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat> <clears throat> Questions? I've got stickers. <laughs> what is I have stickers? <laughs> well, it just means that you know, questions may prompt stickers. No, I'll, I'll give stickers rather than <laughs> Reminder, anyone at home, uh, you can ask your question in the WebAssembly channel, and we can relay it here. So admittedly, this question was in the Slack from Brooks, so I'm taking inspiration from him. But how would you compare and contrast the current WASM movement with the early days of Docker and Linux containers? Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> nice, nice uh, soft uh, uh, label. Um, I think some of the... Um, I, th I wasn't there for the very beginning, so I don't have a, a strong, um, a strong uh, story to tell there. But I think the, the things that I'm seeing on the WASM side is uh, a lot of these initial settling we saw where we were trying to work out what standards matter, um, which things need to be standardized, which things, where should, where should people differentiate, where should companies differentiate, all of that sort of stuff. Um, I'm seeing those sorts of analogies happening, and that's was why I kind of called out the, um, the OCI work where we've done, where think about Think about how do we build an end-to-end -end story? Because I think that we need to find killer. We need to find a couple of killer use cases that are end-to-end, -end so that developers can really uh, start adopting WASM. Right now, it still feels quite fragmented, which makes it really difficult for people to adopt. Um, there are obviously there are people who are using it in production in very various different cases, but there's no uh, mass market easy way of doing that. Um, and Scott's going to have to cover his ears, but I think because you could throw processes existing binaries into Docker containers, and they were just better just doing that. Um, that kind of helped us as well because it, uh, there's a lot of brownfield software out there, and, and helping people um, get that running, in, or putting that inside a container was net better than uh, than running it on a host. Um, and and you know that kind of removed some of the friction for getting people to to have an end-to-end -end flow that was better than what they had before. So yeah, I think that would be the thing that I would focus on with uh, with Wasm now. Uh, Chris, yep. Yep. Um, uh, Sven in the Slack. Uh, so everybody who wants to ask questions in Slack, feel free, uh, is asking, uh, how does Docker know when to run a, a, a WASM runtime? So right now, um, it's configured inside my compose file. Uh, and let me just hide this. Oh, come on. There we go. Um, I've configured it inside my compose file to make it explicit to show that I want to use a containerd shim. So what's happening here is the Docker engine is um, it's, it runs things through Containerd. In Containerd, you can have different shims for doing different types of uh, workloads. In this case, we have a WASM edge shim, and so I've told it, please run it with a WASM edge shim. Um, ideally, what, with, what we're talking about with the Mobi maintainers, because the Docker engine is, is part of the Mobi project, and, and that's a, an open source community that we work with Mirantis and Microsoft and some others on, uh, what we'd like to do is have some auto detection where based on the architecture type, it would just do the right thing. You'd probably want to make it configurable for users to choose exactly which backend they want to run, because there may be people who want to use some of the, lead, the bleeding edge stuff with WASM Edge, or other people who may want to use a different runtime for, for other reasons. I'll, I can repeat the question as well, yeah. Okay, yeah. so, um, so you've got now 
Yeah, so the, the question was, you now have uh, Docker with WAS, and does that mean we're part of the, the Kubernetes ecosystem? And to clarify that. So the way we've integrated this is through ContainerD, which is a low-level piece for managing um, how it works with containers is it manages the process lifecycle and setting up namespaces and things like that. Um, Kubernetes is a layer on top to orchestrate those containers. Um, and so because we've integrated at the lower level, uh, this should just work with, um, with, with Kubernetes as well. I think Ralph may be talking about that a little later, so I would stick around. <laughs> yeah. But, but this is the advantage of building in at that level, right? We can re-leverage uh, things that already exist. I think reinventing the wheel for the sake of it is, um, unless you're getting really great benefits, it's not, it's not worthwhile a lot of the time. Any other questions? All right. Please join me in thanking uh, Michael and Chris. Thank you.